Well, hey everybody. I wanna welcome you to our last module for our class, module three. Uh, as we talked about when uh, the class first started, some of you, this may be your first time taking a summer school class. And as you probably have already realized, things move really quickly and we've moved pretty quickly through summer school. And we're headed now into our last section after the first two modules, looking at some core concepts and applications of behavior theory, we wanna spend module three looking at a related theory that actually was created out of behavior theory called cognitive behavior theory or CBT. It's very possible that some of you have already learned about CBT in the DAC 1311 counseling theories class. I know many of us, whenever we teach that class, and that's true for me, I always make a point to cover CBT uh, whenever I teach counseling theories. I know that's true for many professors uh, who you may have taken for counseling theory. So it could be a little bit of a review for a few of you. It could be an introduction for others of you. But either way, CBT is a great uh, helping approach and we're just gonna do a little bit of intro and in this first part of module three, and talk about the two, the first two core beliefs of CBT. Very, very quickly, I know a couple of announcements. I know by now you have kind of gotten uh, how the class works, but just a way of reminder. Um, so this is part A, this video kind of starts part A of module three. And in about a week on Thursday, July the 2nd, uh, Part B will open, and Part B will kind of be our, our send-off, our finale for the class. And I'll have a, a little uh, video and some PowerPoint for you as well, too, on Thursday, July the 2nd. But you have between to now and the 2nd to work through the first part of this module. As you'll see, I have posted for you PowerPoint slides, some videos, some handouts. I've posted for you the CBT case study, which is your last written assignment. Uh, that you'll do for me. You just did a behavior theory or behavior mod case study, and now you'll do a CBT case study. And that will be due on Monday, July the 6th by 12 noon, which is also when quiz number three opens. So just make sure you're looking at the to-do list. Make sure you are looking at the syllabus and just kind of keeping up. We're almost done. And so by now you probably have it uh, all under control and all down. But you're doing great. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're having a good summer and uh, appreciate your flexibility, adaptability, and uh, getting used to taking online classes. And this has been a good class and I appreciate your hard work. Y'all are working hard. So let's talk about cognitive behavior theory. You may remember way back in module one, we talked about how one of the core beliefs of behavior theory, old school behavior theory, was that human behavior has three forms. You may remember that, that was just a few weeks ago. Uh, human behavior is what we do, it's what we say, and it is what we think. And you, that may have been, probably not, but that may have been the first time in that conversation that you were introduced to the term cognitive behavior. This theory that we're going to look at this module is called cognitive behavior theory. And we'll talk here in a little bit how the word cognitive is kind of where it all centers uh, with this theory. So you're already familiar with the idea that one of the ways in which we behave or we act is outwardly through our physical and verbal behavior, overt behavior. But then also too, there is inward uh, covert behavior. Well, what is covert behavior? Well, really covert behavior is our cognitive behavior, the way in which we talk or think to ourselves. And that's the center of this theory. For many, many years, traditional behavior theory just focused on overt, that outward, observable, easily measurable, physical and verbal behavior. And several years ago, behavior theory expanded and it said, we're gonna, we're gonna begin to consider and include cognitive behavior into our definition of behavior. Well, why did they do that? Well, they did that primarily because of the work of one man named Albert Ellis. Albert Ellis, was, who passed away just a few years ago, um, was a young psychotherapist, psychologist, uh, living in New York City, who was trained in traditional Freudian psychotherapy, as everybody was back in his day. And Ellis developed something called cognitive, well, what we call today cognitive behavior theory. I don't mention this in the lecture notes, but you may have heard 
of CBT referred to by something else, another set of initials called REBT. That was the initial title that Ellis gave CBT. REBT, Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy. And he, as a young man in his 30s, uh, kind of set the counseling world on its ear when he created REBT, what we call today CBT. And I want to give you a little background on Albert Ellis. It's through Ellis's work with CBT that we consider today cognitive behavior a form of behavior. It is a form of, it's a way in which we act. And uh, the reason that we now consider that is really because of the influence of cognitive behavior theory in Albert Ellis's work. Um, some of you have heard this in other classes. I mentioned this in the lecture notes. Um, CBT is probably one of the most, if not the most, utilized helping approach today in modern uh, American counseling. If you were to research today therapists, uh, social workers, people doing counseling, doing mental health counseling, marriage and family counseling, working with kids, working with addiction, and you were to kind of survey a thousand or five thousand or ten thousand or however many thousand therapists, and you were to survey and ask them, Tell us what kinds of approaches you tend to use. The cognitive behavioral approaches would more than likely be at the top of the list. This is a very well-known, highly utilized counseling approach that I was personally, like many people in my generation, I was first introduced to in graduate school. Um, when I was back in training and I was in school like you, I was getting my master's degree in counseling back in the dark ages, was the first time not only was I introduced to CBT as a theory, but then I was taught it as a counseling student, if I can say it that way. As I began to work with people and practice in working with people, and I began to be supervised and observed, I really, CBT was one of the first theories I was kind of given to kind of use. And so I always highlight that, not, not that it's the best, not that it works equally well with everybody, because it doesn't, but it's a very, very, very well-known counseling approach. And if you're gonna work in the field of social services, you need to be familiar with CBT. Real quick, here's the background. I always, now personally, I, I, like, um, I like to study not just, for example, Freud's theory. I like to study Freud as a person. I think psychoanalytic theory kind of makes more sense when you understand who Freud was. Um, I think that person-centered theory developed by Carl Rogers, to me, I had a greater appreciation for person-centered theory when I took the time to study who was Carl Rogers. I mean, who was he as a person? Where did he study? How did he grow up? Um, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, I, like to, I like to cover in my theories class something called reality theory. Uh, reality theory is an approach that I've used a few times in my, over the years. It was developed by a man named William Glasser. And uh, reality theory made more sense to me when I studied who Glasser was. Well, that's true for cognitive behavior theory. To me, Albert Ellis has always had a fascinating story. And I think if you hear his story, you'll, it'll give you a greater appreciation for CBT. Ellis was born uh, in New York City. He was the oldest of five children. He was raised by a single mother who had a mental health problem. She had bipolar disorder. And Ellis's parents divorced when he was very, very young. And Ellis had many medical problems. He barely survived his birth. He was very short in stature. He was born with low birth weight. He was born with a kidney ailment. And through the, through the course of the first 10 or 15 years of his life, he was, in many, he was in the hospital many, many times. He had two or three major surgeries, very, very weak, very, very frail. So his family kind of sheltered him. They, they, he did not go to traditional public school because he wasn't able to medically. And so Ellis was incredibly intelligent and bright. And he was by himself a lot because his parents basically kind of sheltered him. And so while all the other kids were out playing in the streets and having fun, Ellis, by his own admission, was like an 11-year-old boy reading the encyclopedias, reading the newspaper. Ellis was, he was just very, very bright and very, very, very intelligent. But he was kind of sheltered. And he grew up with a single mom. And he grew up with a mom who, as he wrote later in his life, had a lot of anxiety. His mother, because again, part of her bipolar disorder, but also too, just, he said she was just kind of a nervous person, always worried, always fretting, always thinking something bad was about to happen. Um, he, had, he has written later in his life that that was kind of who his mother was. He kind of grew up in that environment 
with a protective, sheltering mother who was always worried something bad was about to happen. And in the middle of all that environment, Ellis thrived. Ellis graduated from high school early. He went to college, uh, studied business, uh, but quickly realized, kind of like some of you, he took a couple psychology classes as a requirement for getting his business degree. And even though he graduated with a business degree, he realized he didn't want to be an insurance salesman or whatever you do with a business degree. He wanted to be like a psychologist or a counselor because he loved psychology. He returned to college, got a bachelor's degree, another bachelor's degree in psychology, master's degree in counseling, PhD at a young age, young 30-something-year-old PhD, studying at Columbia University in New York City. Back in that day, the only theory that, that was out there for therapists was Freud's psychoanalytic theory. So Ellis was taught psychoanalytic theory. Uh, he studied under some great nationally known therapists at Columbia. And when he was in his 30s, Ellis was using the traditional Freudian psychotherapy, which basically teaches that human behavior is complicated. The human psyche is multi-layered. And who knows why people do what they do People really can't be different and change. Our personality is set by the time we're 18, all that kind of stuff, right? So Ellis, as he got, because he was so curious um, as a young man, he just, he got, he got kind of disenfranchised with psychoanalytic theory. His main problem was he didn't like the idea that psychoanalytic theory suggested that to fix a problem within us takes forever. It takes a long time. Glenn, if you want to be a different person, like a different dad or a different professor. Well, you can. It's just going to take you six or seven or 16 or 17 years to learn how to be a different person. Well, there were a lot of people, including Ellis, who didn't like that idea. They thought that just doesn't even make sense. And Ellis did something that many theorists did, including Freud. Ellis began to look at his own life and he began to do a little self-analysis, the counselor counseling and analyzing the counselor, right? We always do that within ourselves. And Ellis began to realize in his own life this. Although Ellis was super successful, PhD from Columbia, he was a well-known, skilled therapist. Like many successful people, Ellis had a secret. Here was the secret. He had a battle. The battle was in his mind. Ellis, by his own admission, as a young man, was just very insecure, we would say. Ellis had this belief that even though he had succeeded, that he was really a failure. Ellis had this nagging belief in his heart that he was about to get fired, that he was about to, that his clients were gonna walk out on him, that he was like a fraud, that even though he had earned everything he felt on the inside, all these insecurities, which by the way, is not uncommon in really successful people. If you've ever known someone who has a lot of success, many very successful people are driven reason why they're driven is because they're kind of insecure. Ellis was that way. And Ellis had this aha moment kind of when he realized that, not to be critical of his mother, but he realized that there were many, many times when he should be happy for his success. And he would say, I heard the, I would hear the voice of my mother in the back of my brain. And my mother would be saying, yeah, but, because she used to send it to him a lot. He would say, hey, mom, I did this, I got an A on this. And she'd say, yeah, but, and she'd kind of water it down. And she would send this message that, yeah, that's not good enough. She began to send this message either intentionally or unintentionally, yeah, you're not good enough. And Ellis began to realize that he had this tape recorder, that there was this voice in his head. It wasn't a hallucination. It was the voice of his mother who had her own issues and kind of taught, Ellis began to realize that he had been taught by his mother, the world is a dangerous place. You can't trust anybody. And there's something wrong with you because she kind of sheltered him. You know, he, he wanted to do a bunch of things as a kid. She said, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. And Ellis began to realize that he had these messages. He had these beliefs, we would say, in his mind and he, he used the metaphor of a tape recorder. It's a great word picture. Even today in CBT, we use, that, we use that metaphor all the time in counseling. The idea that our brain is like a tape recorder. 
And then what happens is, especially, at, not just, but especially as we're growing up, that that tape recorder is on and that all we're doing is recording messages, whether they are spoken or unspoken, about the world, about ourselves, about other people. Now, some of the messages we get growing up are healthy and they're accurate. Ellis began to realize that in his life, and he began to wonder if other people may not be like him, that he had picked up, intentionally or unintentionally, all these beliefs and all these messages about himself and the world that were not true. They were unhealthy and they were inaccurate. Beliefs like, you can't trust people. And Ellis realized, well, that's not true. I can, there are people I can't trust, right? Ellis began to realize that in his mind, there was this message that he had picked up in childhood that, yeah, there's something wrong with you. There's something deep, you're, there's something, whatever you're doing is not good enough. And Ellis believed that as an adult, as a young man in his 30, he had all these beliefs in his mind that were kind of like tape recorded. And he began to realize and set the foundation. He got fascinated with that idea. Up until that time, people really weren't that interested in what we call cognition, the way in which our brain works on a cognitive level, our beliefs and our thinking. Ellis, in his own life, realized this. He realized that the beliefs, the way in which we talk to ourselves, sets the foundation for both how we feel and what we do. That if I believe in my mind, I can't do something. I will naturally feel anxious. And I will naturally play it safe behaviorally. I won't take chances. But where does all that start? It starts right here. It starts with the belief in this instance, that there's something wrong with me or whatever it might be. In the next module, we're gonna talk some more about unhealthy belief systems. We'll talk more about that. But Ellis kind of came upon this idea, core idea, that how we talk to ourselves influences how we feel and what we do. And in his case, he had all these unhealthy, unrealistic kind of messages that he kind of was believing without even really realizing it, and he was kind of living by it. Those beliefs were kind of influencing and affecting how he felt and what he did, not always in good ways. So he began to sort of work with his clients from that perspective. As a young therapist, instead of using the traditional Freudian approach, he began to challenge his clients to think about the messages that they had tape recorded. And he found that a lot of people were like him that a lot of people had all these beliefs that they had learned from either their family or from society or from wherever, or maybe a loved one, whatever, you know. We'll talk more about that next module, where those messages come from. And that a lot of people kind of were like him. And he began to develop this theory called cognitive behavior theory, CBT, which has at its foundation the idea of our beliefs, the way in which we talk to ourselves. So uh, what I've got for you on the next little video is there are four core beliefs that we're going to talk about related to CBT. And we're going to do the first two in part A of this module. Look at the next little mini lecture video. Look at the lecture notes where I outline the first two of these core ideas. Look at the PowerPoint presentation. Look at the handouts. Look at the case study. All that good stuff. And we'll do core idea number one and two in part A of our module this week. And we'll do number three and number four as we wrap our class up in part B of module three. So, see you on the next video.